Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another a live Dhamma talk uh, here with Empty Cloud Monastery. Uh, this evening, we're happy to have with us a special guest, uh, so Bhante Rahula, uh, one of the very senior monks, one of the most senior Western Buddhist monks currently around. Um, so we're very happy to have Bhante Rahula uh, with us to uh, share some teachings on dependent origination and give us some instructions on how to use it in our practice. Uh, so without further preamble, I'll, I'll go ahead and pass it over to uh, Bhante Rahula to guide us in the way that he sees fit to guide us. So please, Bhante, go ahead. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Venerable Sudasu and uh, I as, uh, Soma for inviting me to uh, share some Dhamma with all of you. And so uh, we're going to start with a short meditation just to try to uh, uh, focus, relax our minds, center our minds on the into the present moment using the, the body and the breathing to help anchor our attention to the present moment. So if you're you know sitting in a chair or on the floor there, just try to uh, sit in a comfortable position. Try to keep your back straight and your head, uh, chin lifted up level to the floor. And just relax the shoulders. Just gently close your eyes. And just feel the weight of the body pressing the seat. Try to feel your buttocks and feet pressing the floor. Just feel that solid contact. And just remind yourself of sitting, sitting, the present moment of the body. And feel your hands and fingers touching together where they touch the body. See if you can feel the outline of your fingers or thumbs, just developing awareness of the body. And feel the weight of the show, the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Relax the shoulders. Just try to feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders, upper arms. And just remind yourself of sitting, sitting. Now feel the head balanced on top of the neck. And just lightly center your attention behind the eyes. Just feel your eyes in the sockets. Just feel the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. From that point behind the eyes, just feel some other sensations on your face. Feeling of your lips touching together, the nose. And still kind of just resting the attention behind the eyes, see if you can sort of expand the awareness to feel the outline of the sitting body, the sense of your head on top, arms at the sides, feet underneath, buttocks pressing the seat. Not in details, just a general sense of sitting, sitting. And then take a few deep, slow breaths. Try to take about three seconds to expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs for two or three seconds to feel the pause and feel the relaxing contractions of the out breath. Try to feel the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Just take a few more deep, slow breaths like that, cultivating this basic mindfulness. And breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. 
Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. Now we're going to try to count the breaths from one to ten. Actually, I'll do the counting for you. Just keep your attention. Try to feel the expanding and contracting movements of your abdomen, rib cage, your chest. And on the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Feel the brief pause with the contracting out breath. Also count to one. The next in breath, two. Out breath, two. In breath, three. Out breath three. In breath four. Out breath four. In breath five. Out breath. Five in breath six out breath six in breath seven out breath. Seven in breath eight out breath eight in breath nine out breath Nine in breath ten out breath ten now discontinue the counting let the breathing return to its own uncontrolled shorter irregular rhythm but continue to feel it. You feel the air as it's coming through the nostrils, or as, it, as the lungs expand and contract, whichever spot you're familiar with. And just know when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out. You know it by feeling it. Just try to notice the four phases of the breath cycle, the incoming breath and the brief pause, the outgoing breath and the brief pause. Breath by breath, moment by moment. Especially with each out breath, just letting go of the past and future, allowing the mind to relax more and more into the present moment. 
present moment, sitting, breathing, breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. Breathing body is the natural connection to the present moment. Mind's natural connection to the present moment. Try to feel the breathing body within the larger physical body. Try to feel that organic interconnection of the breathing in the body. Breathing in, sitting, breathing out, sitting. At the same time, be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Just let the thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Keep the feeling of the breathing body in the front of the awareness. There's too many thoughts, come back and do some slightly deeper, slower breathing to help stay grounded, centered in the body.
Breathing in, sitting. Breathing out, sitting. Sensations come and go. Pleasure and pain come and go. Sounds come and go. Thoughts and urges come and go. Thoughts of I, me, and mine come and go. These are all just the continuous flow of the impermanence of the body, mind, and the world through the space of awareness. Through the space of present moment awareness. We lose that connection to the breathing body, the present moment, and the mind gets easily lost and tossed about on the stormy seas of greed, hatred, and deluded thoughts, worry, fear, anxiety. This breathing body acts as our life preserver our lifeline to the present moment. Where we can clearly see deep into our own mind. To discover the causes of suffering. the states of happiness. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live with mindfulness and wisdom. And thus spoke the Buddha. Okay, now, gently place your hands at the edge of the knees. And on the next in-breath, stretch your head back. And pull the hands against the knees to arch your lower spine. Hold it a few moments. And lift the head up with an in-breath. And on the out-breath, press the chin to the top of the chest. To stretch the neck vertebra. Okay. 
lift the chin up level on an in breath and relax on the out breath. Okay, friends, so uh, in this uh, Dhamma talk tonight, I think you have read the title of the talk. I'm going to be trying to kind of go over and explain uh, to a certain extent uh, the concept of the rebirth uh, and especially how it is described in the uh, 12 links of dependent origination or the Paticca Samuppada. So the Paticca Samuppada is a cornerstone uh, discourse or text or teaching of the Buddha, the 12 links of dependent origination. Sometimes it's called interdependent origination. Uh, and there's different aspects to it. In, and of course, you know, the idea of uh, rebirth, at least for most Buddhists, is a central uh, concept or uh, within the Buddhist teaching. And certainly we can see that in many hundreds of different suttas, the Buddha referring to uh, this idea about uh, rebirth. But normally it is explained uh, in what I like to call the uh, lifetime to lifetime rebirth process or external rebirth. Now this also and now it's explained in the in the dependent origination, the 12 links of dependent origination. I'm not going to uh, well I'm going to go through them, but uh, basically it, it uh, explains the process how uh, the mind and body undergoes these various uh, levels of thinking and conditioning uh, that lead the mind to be uh, born again. But actually the term for uh, rebirth in the Pali language is uh, puna bhava or again becoming. And the term of reincarnation that the Hindus often use or some other people that's not really uh, normally in the Theravada tradition. We, we don't uh, you know, use that term because reincarnation often has the idea of some kind of a static soul uh, that reincarnates from lifetime to lifetime. Now that isn't exactly the process that uh, is explained within the Theravada uh, viewpoint or the, the Buddha explained it, and especially in the uh, dependent origination. Now, again, it's a, it's a difficult concept to understand, and we know that many people you know, here in the Western countries may not believe in rebirth because of their other conditionings, philosophical or religious conditions. They may uh, think uh, that you know, that's not true, or even, of course, modern science to a large degree doesn't also uh, recognize that that our mind can uh, this mind can be uh, re-arise in another lifetime after the physical uh, death. So this concept of sansara, so the the process of birth and death is described as samsara, and one of the meanings this Pali word is perpetual wandering. But it basically it refers to our mind. And our mind is what is actually going through this process. The body just kind of is a continuation of that, is an external manifestation of our mind. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the mental aspects, the, the moment to moment rebirth in next week's talk. But in this week, I want to just try to uh, kind of go over this uh, external. Uh, rebirth. I call it external rebirth because, you know, the idea is, okay, when 
we grow old and we die, if the mind still has fuel and still has ignorance, greed, and uh, other defilements, then this is a you know considered to be like a fuel, like a car needs fuel. And when the body dies, the consciousness, this propels the consciousness. And again, it's not our consciousness, as we'll see later, but the consciousness uh, to re-arise in another uh, realm, and not only the uh, human realm, but it, there's other realms of where the mind can be reborn. And it is reborn according to its karmic propensities. What are the strongest accumulated karmic propensities or memories that a person had acquired, uh, not only you know in this one lifetime, but even in lifetimes before this current one. So if a person dies still with these accumulated, uh, what are called sankharas and ignorance, uh, then it will be uh, it will be attracted, basically. No one is sending the mind anywhere. It, it basically gets attracted like a magnetic pull to uh, another uh, dimension or a body uh, that will help it to work out its karma, so to speak. You know, that's a popular uh, phrase these days, you know, people working out their karma. Karma basically means our actions and the accumulated effects of those actions that are within the unconscious mind and that make us continue repeating the similar actions over and over again. So anyway, the Buddha, you know, he, he never pointed out that there was a first cause for when this process of uh, sansara started in individual minds. And so some people might say, well, what do you mean? He didn't point out a first cause and he must not be enlightened, you know? Well, you know, so-and-so, we believe that it was started uh, 5,000 years ago with the, the, this person or these things, and all of a sudden there was people on the earth. I mean, it's not so easy, not so uh, simple as that within the Buddhist uh, uh, sort of cosmological uh, outlook. But anyway, so uh, no first point is determined. But the process of how the mind continues and how the process of the rebirth continues, uh, the Buddha discovered that through his uh, profound, uh, deep meditation and the development of his very powerful mind through, the, through his practice of the Dhamma, through his practice of developing concentration to the maximum uh, degrees. His meditation, developing concentration and mindfulness is like turning up the power of a microscope. And, uh, you know, the Buddha had that ability to develop his concentration to the, you know, to the max, so to speak, and, you know, to the max of an electron microscope and basically smash the atom even as it were, and to see that essentially there is no solid fine particles uh, uh, that exist uh, as such. But anyway, so I don't want to get carried away too far on that. So anyway, the ignorance is considered to be the uh, the primary cause for, the, I wouldn't say the cause of ignorance or the cause of rebirth, but the continuation of it. Okay, it's already cause. We may not know the exact moment, but we can see that it's been continuing for, uh, you know, a long, long period of time. In fact, the Buddha said with his powerful mind, he could go back with his unconscious mind and uncover like, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of past existences. And, you know, he went back so far and he, he was trying to find a first cause and he went back hundreds of thousands of lifetimes and he said, you know, enough is enough, you know. You know it's no point in discovering the beginning. He, he, he saw how it was continuing because of the accumulation of Kama and how the mind was reborn in different realms uh, depending on the vibration of the consciousness, you know, basically about the time of the death. So that the vibration of our consciousness, if it's full of greed, hatred, and delusion, and horrible memories of doing all kinds of, you know, killing, you know, uh, and all kinds of vicious and violent actions, then, uh, then the mind may be attracted to a, a plane where they would, get to experience these similar kinds of things uh, uh, because they were so used to it. 
So it's like the like attract like, like a magnetic pull. A violent mind may be attracted to a violent destiny. And the same way with a very peaceful and calm mind, it could be attracted to the deva realms and celestial realms or even a very good human birth. So I'm not going to bother you with all these different details of the realms of rebirth, uh, but uh, you know you can read those in the Buddhist texts. So, but basically, you know, the law of karma is one of the principal uh, cornerstones of the teachings of of the Buddha, and usually it's called karma and rebirth. But uh, you know, if people don't re believe in rebirth, at least you know they should believe in karma. Because even in this lifetime, even if we are not reborn, even in this lifetime, we reap the results of our suffering over and over and over and over again. So there's enough of that suffering even in this one lifetime to be convinced of the law of karma. Uh, but anyway, I'll talk more about that later. So uh, <clears throat> that's why, you know, the the whole of the, the Buddhist teaching basically in this process of samsara is comes from the first two verses of the Dhammapada, which goes basically all actions are led by the mind. Mind is their master, mind is their maker. If one acts or speaks with an impure state of mind, that means with greed, hatred, or delusion, then uh, suffering and problems will follow that person. Uh, like the a you know, cartwheel follows the foot of the ox. It's a very apt kind of a simile. Uh, if you've ever seen a, a drought ox pulling an ox cart, and the foot, the, the wheel is just that far away from his uh, back feet, pulling these heavy loads. So anyway, and in the same way, if one acts or speaks with a more pure state of mind, with more love, compassion, kindness, uh, and patience, and uh, wisdom, then uh, Comfort and happiness will follow them like the shadow follows around. So this following can follow them in this life with good consequences. And if there's still fuel for rebirth, then uh, the mind will be attracted, as I mentioned, to another. could be a human birth. It could be a birth as an animal or deva or in some Brahma realms. But we might mention those later. So anyway, I just want to... Uh, get to the starting point of ignorance is really what drives the mind. Ignorance means not understanding the Four Noble Truths. Ignorance is defined by the Buddha means not understanding suffering, not understanding the cause of suffering, not understanding that there can be an end to suffering by removing the cause, and the, the path leading to the ending of suffering or the way to live, think, and meditate that will gradually unravel all the karmic knots in the mind and the conditioning and allow a person to experience uh, liberation. So this liberation is usually, you know, called uh, the, the Nibbana. Okay, so I'm just trying to get to a starting point, you know, hereby, you know, so the ignorance, even though there's no first uh, cause, uh, we've accumulated ignorance means not understanding the noble four noble truths, but it means understanding not understanding our mind and not understanding the nature of the world, not understanding how our own mind works. It's ignorance of our own mind, uh, not knowing how it works and not knowing how it's got itself caught up in all these knots of conditioning and especially negative conditioning that keep bringing, uh, you know, a lot of problems and suffering, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. So greed, hatred, and delusion are considered to be the roots of ignorance. But the way the Buddha defined it, it's not understanding the suffering, its cause, the cessation, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So Depending on ignorance, the way the Paticca Samapada is worded, depending on ignorance arises the volitional formations. And these volitional formations are essentially the accumulated uh, habits and conditionings, the wants and the desires and, and the memories. It's a very big uh, uh, group of uh, mental activities, but basically in the unconscious mind. They're all 
sort of, we use the term in the unconscious mind. Uh, but mainly it's it's the habits and the, uh, the habits of thinking and believing and also the memories of things that one have done, whether you were killed or w killed others or were killed and, and had other types of, you know, things, whatever one might have did. But we don't have any real conscious memory of that uh, normally. But anyway, so these uh, sankharas, and especially it's a sankhara of the of the ego sense, the the I, the sense of I, uh, that's there in the mind. But it's also the habits that this I has created, the habits of I like this and I want that, and and uh, these things happen to me, and I'm going to do these things, and you know, all of these are add to the this uh, level of the, you know, the sankara, the, the habits. So this is the fuel that fuels the consciousness. And so depending on ignorance arise volitional formations. So these volitional formations are already there in our mind. I mean, basically we were born, the baby is born already with accumulated ignorance in these volitional formations uh, in their, you know, little baby mind. But as they grow up, then these memories and, and so on from the past get uh, get stronger. So these, uh, when you die, if you have a lot of these, I mean, these volitional formations, if you haven't attained enlightenment, then you're going to have some degree of volitional formations. But the ordinary person who doesn't understand Dhamma or has never practiced meditation or hasn't worked on really purifying their mind of, uh, you know, greed, hatred, and delusions, then uh, their mind is, this is a very powerful energy, you know. And uh, look at the power of the human mind. It's caused, uh, you know, the Holocaust. It's caused uh, all these, uh, you know, every war and, uh, you know, every kind of suffering in the world is due to the mind of greed, hatred, and delusion. And uh, this is a collective kind of thing, you know, because we We've been passing it down through genes and down, down through cultures and conditions. So uh, when the average person dies, these uh, volitional formations will power the consciousness. So when the dead person dies, when the person is dying, it is said that the, the strongest memories or strongest habits that the person had accumulated in the life are going to rise up and be a determining factor in where that, what is called relinking consciousness is uh, attracted to another plane of existence, whether it's to another human uh, mother in the womb, or it could be an animal womb of one has lived like an animal in this life, then they could be reborn as an animal. Or in a deva realm, if their mind was quite pure and so on, and, be born in some celestial realms. But anyway, it's the karma, the sort of the magnetized vibration of consciousness, which is gets attracted to that realm. Again, it's no creator being or anybody else that's saying, oh, now you have to go there because you did this and that. Uh, that's an easy solution, of course, but uh, it's not what the Buddhist, uh, the Buddha uh, understood. So the, this, the sankharas are which drive that consciousness to seek existence again, because in that consciousness, there's the craving to exist, which is called bhava, kama bhava, we'll talk about it later. Uh, so with ego consciousness, uh, and people with strong egos especially, and they, they have that craving to live, or even if you have a craving not to live, uh, We'll talk about that later. But anyway, this uh, ignorance, basically ignorance in these sankharas are like fuel, like a gas tank. Your car, if you're, as long as you keep putting gasoline in the tank, then your car will still keep going, right? Well, these bodies are like our, the car. We keep putting gas in the tank. That means accumulating more and more karma due to greed, hatred, and delusion and ignorance that keeps the, the tank full. And so when you die, this 
fuel just propels the the consciousness to be attracted to a plane of existence where it can kind of uh, carry on, you might say, with its evolutionary state. You know, it's a state of whether it's on a spiritual path or where it's on a path of, you know, <laughs> getting into more and more suffering. So anyway, so so far we have, depending on ignorance, arise the volitional formations. Depending on volitional formations arises the consciousness. And in the lifetime to lifetime, this consciousness means the relinking consciousness that leaves the body at the time of death and some people say it leaves through your head, others through the feet, this and this. And we don't know where it leaves from. But anyway, it leaves leaves the body. That's why when death is pronounced, you know, basically this body is lifeless. Because that consciousness is actually the spark of life that keeps the body alive. But if the body can no longer support the consciousness, because if your breathing stops, your heart beat stops, or for some other reason connected with that, the body is going to die and the consciousness gets released. And uh, really, uh, you know, the average person is not gonna be able to control that. Maybe some very high adepts and people who've developed their meditation skills to very, very, very high degree level and so on, uh, might be able to kind of guide or determine where their mind may go, but normally not. So anyway, then because of uh, because of the consciousness, uh, you get the, the, you know, the relinking consciousness goes into another womb and develops the mind and body. Uh, and actually with the, the, the death, that relinking consciousness comes and then there's birth, but we're going to talk about that uh, later. So this relinking consciousness goes and there's, well, birth takes place again. But then the, the consciousness develops the mind and body. Uh, actually, yeah, the consciousness goes into a womb. There's not birth yet. But so for nine months, let's take the example of a human baby. Uh, so for nine months, this uh, new consciousness, and it's not the same as the old one. It's a, it's a new one. It's, not this, it's this described as not being the same and not being altogether different because the, the habits and memories and so on, it's like a continuity, the simile of a candle flame lighting one candle, lighting an one out candle with a, another candle. And then that flame doesn't go to the, the new candle, but uh, because of the flame from the old one, the new candle got lit whenever there's a new wax in a, in a wick, then the fire will burn again. So. The consciousness needs a body uh, to uh, to uh, work, to experience the work. So anyway, so uh, this consciousness develops what is called nama rupa, the mind and body, which is developing in the womb. Uh, and then finally, the baby gets born. Uh, now this doesn't follow in direct sequence because it's you know it's a little bit complicated to explain. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the the sankaras and, and and so on that came along with the conscious, the rebirth, the relinking consciousness, uh, helped to determine, you know, even what the sex of the baby might be, or whether that baby might have some serious uh, malformations, or you know, different sort of karmic effects. And I know a lot of people find it hard to believe, but anyway, this is a uh, general idea behind this uh, you know progress of this rebirth process so then the baby uh, comes out of the womb uh, and then when the, the so the mind and body is developing in that small baby so you know the small baby after nine months it has a pretty much developed body and consciousness and now it needs exposure to the world so it comes out and there's contact where the six senses Along with the body, there are uh, come the six senses. So we all know the baby has eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So even in the womb, they can hear things too. So the mind and body develop the six senses. 
And then the baby comes out and there's contact with the world. Although we know that even in the womb, there's contact, the baby can hear sounds and so on. But let's keep it simple. Don't make it too complicated right now. So the baby comes out and then its senses are awakened. It can, you know, see things, hear things, smell, taste, touch, feel things. Uh, and this is called contact. So depending on the uh, six senses, we have the contact. Now, the mind contact may not be working too much because there's not too much in the baby's mind yet in terms of memories and likes and dislikes and so on. So there may not be a whole lot of thoughts and other things going on in the young baby's mind. But as it starts to grow up, yes, the mind starts uh, developing its network of synapses and, and all kinds of other you know, brain functions and memory. And then it, you know, it gets uh, evolved. So depending on the, the contact, uh, so depending on the sixth sense, we have contact. Now this is even happening in our uh, regular life. That's why this is a little bit different. What I'm gonna explain tomorrow is gonna be a little bit different than what I'm explaining today. That this contact comes with the birth when the baby comes out of the womb uh, for the most part. And then it encounters the world. And it starts to see things and it starts to, Parents give it a name and, uh, you know, call it little Johnny or Susie. And, uh, you know, in the beginning, the baby doesn't have a built up ego consciousness. Its mind is more expanded, kind of an expanded awareness, what they call oceanic awareness, without a, a nucleus of an ego yet. But the parents give it a name and start, you know, giving it things and relatives come over and hold it and, you know, gitchy, gitchy, goo, little by little a little nucleus of an ego starts to form in the baby's mind. Uh, and then that gets cemented. We start to learn language. So then the, the mind really uh, gets into high gear. And its memory of past life things start to come about. If it smells something, oh, it smelled like something maybe from a past life or saw something, you know, we've seen stories or you on the TV or in books about young kids who are five or six years old who, the parents were on a drive and they saw a house and hey, that's my house. And the parents would think, what are you talking about? You know, and, you know, you've heard these stories before. Or the World War II pilot who got shot down in the ocean and then he he remembered the, his, where his plane went down and all kinds of stories. So these memories from the past life, especially with children, uh, can uh, come up uh, because their mind is still kind of fresh. It's not burdened with the day-to-day -day concerns of, you know, the older people. So anyway, uh, so then craving develops. So dependent on contact, craving arises. So the baby starts developing likes and dislikes and depending on sensation. I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but it's important. It's a very important aspect about understanding how the mind got conditioned. Uh, so, you know, in the beginning, you know, the baby really doesn't have any conscious likes or dislikes and doesn't really know anything. But, you know, maybe the, the grandmother comes by with the first sweet and the baby touches, tastes the first chocolate and gets a pleasant feeling. Uh, so it's a pleasant feeling. And then the baby uh, recognizes the face and associates that with a pleasant feeling. This face, this pleasant feeling becomes because his face came around. Uh, and then maybe the uncle or grandfather didn't give the baby anything or maybe held it too tight and caused discomfort. And then the baby starts to recognize, oh, that face causes pain. And, uh, you know, and starts to fear, doesn't want that face to come again in the future. So little by little with all, you know, maybe the cat comes by and you know, scratches the baby or something. And then you, you got the fear of the cat. So these perceptions then become associated with pain or pleasure. And as the baby grows up month by month, year by year, experiencing different things, everything that it comes into contact with, it's either he categorizes it as something he likes or dislikes. He may not do that consciously, but these are, you know, nervous system conditionings. So everything basically becomes a pleasurable or a painful feeling or a neutral feeling. But neutral feelings don't, 
you know, cause too much suffering. Uh, they're very subtle. But the pain and pleasure one, ones, the ones we develop desire for. So we desire, the baby starts wanting pleasurable feelings and he wants to avoid the painful feelings. So actually at this point, the past and future start to be born in the baby's mind also. Um, because he's hoping that pleasurable feeling that grandmother will come again or anything else that causes a pleasurable feeling, it's hoping it will come again. And anything that gave it a, a painful feeling, it's hoping it won't come again. And uh, so it starts also developing fear for painful feelings and craving and desire for pleasurable feelings. Uh, and that's mainly because it's lost that natural connection to the present moment. And I forgot to mention that, you know, for nine months in the womb, basically the, the, the little mind of the developing fetus was based probably most of the time in a state of present moment awareness, feeling all that tremendous energy of going from a one cell organism at the time of conception to a multi-billion or trillion cell organism at the time of nine months of birth. And that's a lot of energy, you know, going through the nervous system. So, you know, probably our consciousness was just really, you know, there consumed by that process in a state of kind of being at one with it. I mean, I don't know, I can't remember time in the womb, but you know, or whatever it's worth. So anyway, uh, so basically the, the, in, the, in the baby's mind when it's born also is, is basically in a state of present moment awareness, but gradually it loses that as I already mentioned, once they start to identify things as pleasurable or painful and then wanting them in the future and wanting to, to go away. That's how the past and future, we and we get disconnected from the body. And the, the minds, the baby's mind starts focusing in the external world. And it uh, loses that intimate uh, connection with the, the body, which is basically always in the present moment, those present moment vibrations of, of the body. And so its mind gets focused uh, in, in the future primarily. And then it develops the craving. So then dependent on this contact arises craving. And craving basically is the desire to get things in the future that we don't have, usually connected with pleasurable feeling in any of the senses, something we want to see, hear, taste, smell, touch, even think about. We have some pleasant memories we like to think about. We enjoy to think about them or painful memories we don't want to think about. And so we, you know, have a version. So anyway, the, depending on these, uh, the contact, these feelings arise, actually, depending on contact, the feelings arise, pleasant and painful feelings. And depending on that, the craving means there's positive craving. We want the pleasurable feelings and negative craving. That means we want to get away from the painful feelings. And the mind gets caught up in this process and virtually the rest of the life, the mind is probably 95% of the time just going back and forth between wanting pleasurable sensations and wanting to get away from pleasure, uh, painful, uncomfortable sensations. So that's where the, the craving and aversion arise. So depending on the feeling, we develop craving. And craving means both craving for and craving to get away from. And actually, there's three kinds of craving uh, mentioned by the Buddha and some other suttas. That means the craving for uh, sensual pleasures, the craving for being, that means we, we crave to live, we want to live. Or some people might want to die, which is called craving to die or to get annihilated. You know, they're so disgusted or with life that uh, they want life to end, they don't want to live anymore. So that's called a craving not to exist anymore. Uh, and then, so this craving is, you know, the, this fuel that then starts the karma process. And then there's grasping, dependent on craving arises grasping. Now grasping is basically a stronger form of craving. So craving is the initial thought that comes into our mind. We might think, oh, you know, I, I want an ice cold soda on a hot day or something, or 
you know, you see some person and you might have some slight desire arise in the mind about wanting to, you know, get close to this person. But if you have a strong mindfulness, then you might recognize that and the thought may go out of your mind and it might not do anything, it might not go any place. But if you latch on to that object and you say, yes, I, I, I want to have that object, I need that object. Uh, that's called the grasping. That means you're grasping the object, you're holding on to it and building it up. And so grasping basically is the continued thinking about how you're going to get a hold of that object or how you're going to get away from the object. You know, the planning, the scheming, the conniving, the telling lies, this is whatever, the whole gamut of, uh, you know, actions and thoughts, you know, how the mind, mind works to get what it wants, right? And it can be very devious. Right? So, uh, you know, but that's part of the grasping. The craving itself is not really that strong. Uh, you know, but it turns into grasping if you don't know how to practice, if you haven't trained your mind. So, you know, for all intents and purposes, the craving immediately turns into grasping for, you know, a lot of people a lot of the time. And then this grasping, so again, the grasping can go on for a lot. It could be a, like a whole series of thoughts in your mind. How am I going to get this? How am I going to get this? Uh, you know, and, and then finally you come to a point of uh, making a decision. And you make a decision. And that is called the, the becoming or bhava. So depending on grasping arises becoming. Now, it's a little bit complex, but to keep it simple, I'm going to talk more about tomorrow. But it means that karma is stronger. That means those habits, you've just completed a habit, you've repeated a habit of lying, stealing, whatever, injuring something, uh, sexual misconduct, taking alcohol or drugs. So th these, these habits become stronger. That's why it's called becoming. The habits are becoming stronger. And they are going to give fuel for continued mental activity and for continued rebirth. So we go on this process, through this process over and over again, life, the craving, grasping and becoming process. This means the accumulation of karma. Really the grasping and becoming is where you're creating karma, especially the becoming. That means you make a conscious decision, I'm gonna tell this lie and you tell it. And then, then once you've told the lie, you can't really take it back. And somebody finds out about it, they're going to get angry or, you know, some results come to you or so many other things. You know, you sleep with somebody else's husband or wife or whatever, they come looking for you. So, uh, and so those, that becoming has, causes its uh, results. And, you know, of fear, worry, anxiety, as well as just downright physical suffering. You might get stabbed or shot or any number of uh, things. Intoxicate your mind, get in a car, drive when you're drunk and crash and maybe kill yourself or even worse, kill others. So all these things happen when the mind is, you know, driven by this cravings and delusion. So at the time of death, so this goes on the whole life and accumulating more and more and more stronger memories and habits, depending on how you live. Now, it could be good with things, too. You can also perform good karma. And so like meditation and uh, be practicing kindness and compassion and patience and developing wisdom, you know, uh, developing your mind in, in, in wisdom and developing concentration. You, you can uh, develop the mind in very wholesome states that will, if you die with the mind in those wholesome states, it will be attracted to a a plane or a state where you're going to experience uh, probably at least not too much suffering or anyway where you'll be able to continue uh, kind of at what level you left off in your evolution. We'll call it evolution. So evolution of the mind. So anyway, the becoming, uh, you know, gives rise to birth. So again, this is the lifetime to lifetime process. So this mind that we've been packing with fuel, keep refueling the tank over and over and over again with, with karmic actions. Uh, then when you die, the person dies, 
that consciousness again, as we talked about in the beginning, then again, it is attracted to another plane of existence according to its comma, and then is, then carries on again, gets born again as a baby. And then that whole process continues over and over again, ad infinitum, as long as the ignorance is powered by these uh, sankharas, especially the sankharas of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, this uh, process of birth and death, or they call it external birth and death, because it means externally these bodies, right? Uh, so this external this body that we can feel dies, and then a new baby comes out of the womb, and you know, so uh, or what we call lifetime to lifetime but then death. And so the B Buddha saw that this process will go on indefinitely until one starts to kind of wake up. And maybe, you know, people beating their head against the wall, uh, you know, they keep on doing the same mistakes over and over again, keep suffering in the same old ways because of their habits. And, uh, you know, people come to their wit's end and, you know, they try all kind of therapies and drugs and other things to try to, you know, get out of their negative psychological states or to overcome their habits, you know, these detox centers and, and uh, you know, not learning how to weaken their ego and hatred towards others and all these strong uh, defilements in the mind that uh, keep on harming ourselves and harming the world at large. And it's because of, and you know, the five precepts are a very important part of the Buddhist uh, training. Uh, and we're going to talk that, about that tomorrow when I talk about how Sila, Samadhi, and Panya are directly related to these stages of craving, grasping, and becoming. Uh, but for now, uh, the five precepts helps a person to refrain from these gross types of negative behaviors that produce the, the strongest types of suffering. And when you, I think you all know that, you know, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, telling lies and hateful speech, slandering and uh, intoxicating the mind and so on. So almost all the ills of the world, individual suffering as well as collective suffering can be traced back to uh, people not being able to follow these five skillful guidelines or what we call skillful living, skillful conduct. And simply because the, of the power of the past habits and the power of ignorance. So uh, if, at some point, individuals start to question the whole meaning about life and about what they're doing. And they might try to then, that's usually when the spiritual path and and people start to get interested in things like spiritual teachings, and especially the, the Dhamma. So, uh, because the Dhamma gives a, a, a good explanation to how this whole process of suffering and so on has come about, <coughs> whereas other religions, <coughs> excuse me, make some water. So, you know, other types of philosophies or religions, they, they don't really give up. I mean, they have their own theories about how the earth started and how life started. But, uh, you know, as far as Dhamma is concerned, uh, you know, we don't uh, consider that any kind of ultimate uh, explanation. Or, uh, but anyway, I don't want to get into any <laughs> arguments or discussions about that. Um, so the the way of uh, to slow down this process of of, of rebirth, uh, the, even the external process of rebirth, especially of you know, and again, a lot of people, the rebirth is according to our actions. And if if you do these negative actions like break the precepts and live in an unskillful way, then you know. Even in other religions, they say if you live like that, you might be born in, 
you know, some realms of suffering, whether some other being sent you there or something, whatever the beliefs are. Uh, but so, you know, uh, some religions have you fear the wrath of God. That if you, you break these precepts, you know, God is going to punish you. But that concept is not there in, in this Buddhist teaching. It said your karma is going to sort of punish you. It's the habits that you've accumulated that is are going to uh, cause the continuation of this process of developing bodies and living again and they keep repeating the same cycles over and over again. Uh, so anyway, when a person starts to wake up to that, uh, then they try to, you know, the idea is to purify the mind of greed, hatred, and delusion. So to weaken the, the suffering effects in this life, and if you're born in the next life, hopefully the next life uh, would uh, not have so much suffering in it. So the whole idea of Dhamma practice is by following the Noble Eightfold Path and so on. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. That, uh, you know, gradually you can weaken the strength of the Sankars. It's all about the Sankars because that's what propels the consciousness. And uh, so the ignorance and Sankaras. So uh, through the Dhamma practice, we weaken those by developing meditation and so on. And, uh, and then hopefully, uh, you know, the mind won't be so much filled with greed and hatred or guilt, worry, remorse, and fear, because that's what largely causes people's minds to be attracted to realms of misery and nightmares, and because they have all these guilt, worry, remorse, and fear of having done negative wrong things and unskillful things and also greed and hatred not having forgiven people and wanting to get revenge so even that wanting to get revenge of somebody if you die with that still in your mind that's going to be the fuel for rebirth to come around and perhaps meet that person in another life to, because this has happened there were those stories in, in the buddhist uh, the stories of the buddhist past lives where he explains these things now people may not believe it but uh Anyway, so the idea is to weaken uh, those greed, hatred, and delusion before you die, not thinking you do it at the time of death, but at the time of you die, so that hopefully the mind will be attracted to more pleasant states of existence until finally you can start practicing meditation and go th and then eventually reach the paths of uh, realization and uh, and eventually to reach the, you know, the uh, enlightenment or the uh, the end of suffering. The, the Buddha called it the end of suffering. Or nibbana means the end of suffering, the end of greed, hatred, and delusion. And and therefore you empty the tank. So only through the practice of purifying the mind of greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, through the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path, and we'll talk about it again to, uh, next week. Uh, then gradually, if you die and you, you've reached that final stage of enlightenment, then there's no more fuel for the mind and the mind will not be reborn. And don't ask, where does the mind go after death? That is something the Buddha never uh, pointed to, uh, because you can't really describe that. Uh, so, but basically, it's the unconditioned state. Actually, it's called the deathless state or the unborn state. And I've given some talks on some of my other uh, Zoom programs that I give on uh, uh, another uh, channel that uh, I've talked about in these uh, various uh, states and actually talked about this, the deathless state, the unborn state and so on. But it's basically having transcended the ego and ego consciousness that the mind uh, is no longer attracted to individual existence and it basically becomes, well, the, the only simile that comes to mind is if you have an ice cube floating in water, then the ice cube is made of water, isn't it? But 
it thinks it's different from the water. It thinks it's separate from the water, but the ice cube is actually water, isn't it? So our individual ego consciousness thinks it's different from other people around us, thinks it's different from the outside, outside world, the subject-object consciousness. Now, when that ice cube melts, when the ego consciousness melts and never comes back together again, then can you say, where did my water go? You can't say the water doesn't exist, but you can't say it exists either in, a, in any identifiable state. So even though even that's probably not the, exactly a, the exact uh, experience, but it's probably one of the better examples we can give with our limited language. So anyway, the, so that process of sansara or the perpetually wandering mind from uh, birth to birth to birth and death, birth and death, accumulating karma, oh, that process is brought to an end. And along with it, all the suffering that comes along with birth and death so uh, you know dependent on the that becoming arises birth and because you are born again then the whole cycle continues so there's old age again you get old and there's also suffering lamentation pain grief and despair in that next life and then uh, you know we're dead and the whole process repeats and so next week I'm going to talk about uh, the moment-to-moment -moment rebirth. Now, you know, a lot of people, you know, they ask, you know, you know, can we really, you know, can we be a Buddhist without believing in rebirth? And, you know, uh, the short answer would, would say, well, it depends. <laughs> you know, you may not believe in lifetime-to-lifetime -lifetime rebirth yet. Okay, if you don't believe in it, it's no big deal right away. It's no big deal. But to believe in moment-to-moment -moment rebirth in order to make any progress in, in reaching any kind of happiness even in this life, you have to understand the nature of the mind. And you have to understand how the mind is undergoing this same process from ignorance all the way to death every moment. And, uh, you know, that's a little bit more difficult to understand. And I'll try to explain it uh, yeah, next week in a little bit more detail, perhaps, and some other things. But, uh, you know, this Paticca Samapada, it's very profound, you know, and it, it, you can't be, it can't be understood by the, the common mind. That's why the common person can't grasp this. And even the Buddha said, this, this Dhamma is for the wise person, you know. It, it's not everybody's going to get it, you know, and it's true. So, uh, but people with an open mind and with a reasonable degree of intelligence, they, they can contemplate these things and they can uh, develop some understanding uh, about it. But anyway, so, uh, you know, Ananda was the Buddha's uh, attendant, the Buddha's personal, personal assistant for, you know, over 40 years. And he memorized all the Buddhist sutras. And, and Ananda was only a Sotapanna. He hadn't attained full enlightenment yet. And he told the Buddha, oh, this dependent origination, you know, it, it's so it's so clear, you know, explain it so nicely. It's just so, so clear as can be, you know. And the Buddha said, don't think like that, Ananda, because the Buddha knew Ananda wasn't fully enlightened yet. And Ananda didn't understand this moment-to-moment -moment rebirth. He might have intellectually understood uh, the lifetime to lifetime rebirth, uh, but he didn't understand the real depth of uh, the mind. And so the Buddha was telling him, don't say that, Ananda. This dependent origination appears deep and it is deep. And it's because people have not understood this dependent origination that their minds have been revolving through the rounds of samsara, samsara, virtually from beginningless time. And uh, And according to that theory, we've all, in all those perhaps millions of, of lifetimes, we've all been interconnected in one way or another. That we've all been each other's mother, brother, father, sister, son, friend, enemy, and stranger throughout this long course of sansara. That's why when you meet somebody, immediately you might have some affinity to them or you might have some aversion, even though you don't really know them. These could be coming from 
past life experiences that we we have forgotten about they were buried in the unconscious mind and like if you haven't forgiven somebody you know or you had strong love and attachment the minds could get back together even in future lives there are examples of that and now again you may not believe in that but we're not saying that you have to believe in that but the 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 moment to moment rebirth to understand the mind how the mind is accumulating suffering from moment to moment that you have to understand in order to be able to uh, then weaken uh, the factors that keep uh, uh, feeding that process of accumulating suffering <clears throat> so i think uh, i may have you know gone over this subject uh, enough for this evening now i know it's a, you know it's a very big subject that i haven't gone into it in details but again next uh, wednesday night i guess it's on the same channel at the same time that i will be going over this uh, uh, process of internal rebirth or sometimes i call it macro mac macrocosmic rebirth and microcosmic rebirth uh, I mean, the macrocosmic, you know, the idea of lifetime to lifetime, you know, the larger samsara as opposed to microcosmic, which means the moment to moment, just the process that's occurring in the individual uh, mind. And how we use that to uh, uh, transform uh, the mind using the Eightfold Path and the three stages of Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. Okay? So I don't know if there's time for any questions or not. Uh, let me see if Venerable uh, uh, Sudasso is around or they uh, allowed for that, or I, I don't know. Or... Yes, Pante. Yes, Pante, there's uh, several questions. Um, so maybe we can try to get through a few of these questions. Um, I see at least three questions. The first one is from Gita. Gita asks, Bhante, do sankharas act as fuel to our consciousness for continued birth? Uh, well, that's what I was uh, saying in this talk. It's the sankharas that are, have been powered by ignorance and that we've accumulated in this life. They go into the unconscious mind and they become the sankharas that then come along with the rebirth consciousness to the, uh, the, the new baby uh, you know, in the new life. Yes, it's the sankaras. And there's we we create new sankaras later on that I'll talk about next week uh, in day to day. And those continually you work in a feedback loop that keep on feeding back into the sankaras that are gonna keep propelling the mind uh, forward. I mean it's a it's kind of a complex thing to understand. Thank you, Bante. And Pial asks, uh, can craving for non-becoming be a subtle form of desire for release, a corruption of insight, a higher form of fetter towards the end of the path before right release? Well, there could be a, a desire for attaining liberation, not, I wouldn't call it non-becoming. Uh, but yeah, non-becoming, that means you reduce the becoming and you create positive becoming instead of negative becoming. So first you've got to, you can't just eliminate all becoming. Most people are not going to be able to do that right away. Uh, so we have to decrease the negative becoming that causes most of the suffering. And we have to create the wholesome qualities, uh, the wholesome states of mind, like generosity and love, compassion, wisdom and mindfulness and, uh, you know, these kind of wholesome qualities. So that's called positive becoming. And that will give us the right conditions to accumulate more and more good karma, so to speak, and to uh, keep in contact with the Dharma and people that we can continue to uh, learn from. So uh, the, the craving for non-becoming uh, is uh, first, you have to develop the desire to attain the, the higher realms of becoming, uh, whether it's a human being, and then you have to work gradually through the uh, stages of letting go of the attachment to the uh, Brahma realms and then the formless realms. 
Uh, we may talk more about that uh, maybe t tomorrow. But you know, it's a complicated subject. Okay, thank you. And uh, PL also asks, uh, is Sankara already present even before the six sense bases are triggered, forming more volitional formations as per dependent, I think she means dependent origination. Um, can these be classified as asavas? Well, asavas are the outflows, basically, yes, asavas are the sankaras too. Uh, but yeah, the sankaras come with the consciousness. Now, the six senses are not developed in the fetus right away, right? I don't know. They might come some months later. They start developing eyes or, you know, whatever in the womb. It takes nine months, right, to, to get a, a, the, the senses kind of fully developed. And then you're, you're born. So the sankaras might be, if you had the karma to be born blind, then the sankaras might be helping to condition uh, the conditions of that developing fetus that, you could be born blind or some other type of deformities. So those would, those are in the sankaras and the memories, the karmic memories and so on, accumulated from the past life. So that can happen uh, according to you know the Buddha. And, uh, and that you bring those propensities uh, with us. Great, thank you, Bhante. And the last question for tonight is from Kumu. Uh, Kumu asks, Bhante, if we recognize craving arising and then stop it before it becomes grasping, isn't that a good place to stop the process? Isn't craving to grasping easier to break than the other steps of the 12? No. I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. Becoming is the easiest one to break. And then grasping, craving is the hardest one to break. It's the last one to go. But I'll explain that tomorrow. You may not understand it right now, but hopefully... I mean, not tomorrow, excuse me, next Wednesday. Okay, well, that's the last of the questions. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Bhante, for your Dhamma talk and for uh, answering questions. Um, so we can all end the program with three sadhu. So please join your hands in Anjali, wherever you are. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May you all be well, happy, and peaceful. May all your hopes and wishes succeed. May you attain freedom from suffering in this very life. Sadhu. And remember, mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away. <laughs> and if you would like to have more programs with Bhante Rahula, you can follow him on uh, his own channel, I believe. Um, and you can also visit his retreat center in Maryland. Um, so he is offering some um, limited attendance programs at his temple. So you're welcome to check that out. Uh, if you want to learn more on dependent origination, uh, the second part of Bhante Rahula's talk will be same time next week. So Wednesday at the same time next week. Um, and also tomorrow in the morning, Bhante Kusala will be also giving a talk on uh, Paticca Samupada. And tomorrow evening, Bhante Sankicca also on dependent origination. This is dependent origination week at Empty Cloud Monastery. Yeah, helpful. <laughs> yeah the more perspectives, the better I find. That, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. So uh, that's it for this evening. So thank you again, Bhante, for your guidance and teachings. And thank you to everyone who joined in. Um, so we'll see you next time. Okay. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya. <laughs>